Almighty God, as we approach your word this day, <clears throat> I pray that each one of us would receive that word that you have for us through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. This is a common experience many of us have, but did you ever need to go speak with someone about an important matter, but you were terrified of going to see them? That happened to me when I was about 16 years old. And I felt that God was calling me to go into the ministry to serve them. And I needed to go speak with my priest, Father John. And I had been at that church for about six or seven years, and I watched him grow the church, or God grow the church, but through his ministry, and I had an incredible amount of respect for him, believing he was a holy man. And uh, I was scared out of my eyes to go see him. And I knew he was a kind and loving man, but still, I held him in awe at what he was, who he was, and what he represented. <laughs> but I went to see him. And it turns out that he wasn't so bad after. And he said, and I quote, I've been waiting for you to come and talk to me. Because he knew that God was calling me into this ministry. In today's gospel, we have a story about Jesus and someone going to see him. And oftentimes, we have this longing, this deep, desire to be with Jesus, to spend time with God. And you need to know that God put it there uh, intentionally. But many of us are afraid to actually do that. Now we'll come to worship and we'll worship God, but I'm talking about that deep, intimate communion where you're in the presence of God. It's just you and the end. But there's three things we can learn from today's gospel story about God and about Jesus that I hope will help us to be able to move into that intimate communion that I'm talking about. See, Nicodemus is a ruler of the Jews. He's, he's on the ruling council, so he's, he's a big wig. He's an important person in Jerusalem. Everyone knows who Nicodemus is. And he comes to Jesus at night. Now, I find that fascinating. I guess he didn't want everyone to know that he was going to see Jesus. See, Jesus already had this reputation. He had gone into the temple and driven out the money changers. So he was already on the bad side of all the leaders including Nicodemus, who is coming to see him. Remember, he's on the ruling council. He couldn't have been happy that Jesus had driven out the money changers. But yet he comes, and, and his opening statement is fascinating. We know that you are a teacher who has come from God. And and instead of saying, oh, yeah, thank you, you know, this humility, whatever, that you and I might display, thank you for that, we appreciate your kind words, Jesus totally takes over the conversation and says, you must be born again. We have no idea why Nicodemus actually came to see Jesus. His opening statement was just that. It was an opening statement. And Jesus, I'm thinking, interrupted the man with what he had to say. We don't know if he was coming to chastise Jesus for what he had done in the temple. We don't know if he was coming to Jesus to ask him some questions. We don't know what his motives were. But there he was in front of Jesus. And Jesus says, you must be born again. Totally took over the conversation. 
But what we find in this interchange is that Jesus is approachable. He didn't tell Nicodemus, nah, I don't want to have anything to do with you. You're, you're part of that ruling council. You're one of the leaders. You're one of the reasons there's problems with the people. Later on, he says, woe to you Pharisees, you hypocrites. And Nicodemus is a Pharisee. And he could have said that right then, but no, Nicodemus came to him and he was approachable, even though he knew all about Nicodemus. Secondly, Jesus was willing to listen. Nicodemus came and had that opening statement and he listened to what he had to say. But then, of course, he took the conversation where he wanted it to go. And, and often he'll do that with us. But he does that for good purpose, obviously. There's always a reason why Jesus takes us where he does when we're in prayer, for instance. When I was praying about going into the ministry, I made it very clear to Jesus that I did not want to be a parish priest. I thought that would be the most boring thing in the world. And I let him know very clearly that's not what I wanted. So here I am. <laughs> and that's what he does. He'll listen and then he'll speak the truth. And that's what he did with Nicodemus. And then the third thing he'll do is he'll speak, as I just said, the unexpected. And that's what he did with Nicodemus. He said, you must be born again. And then they had this wonderful conversation about what that means. And it ends with Jesus saying, eternal life to those who believe. That's not what I'm pretty sure Nicodemus didn't have that on his mind when he came to Jesus. That's where Jesus wanted it to go. He took the conversation in an unexpected direction. And we need to be ready when we kneel in prayer, when we spend time in intimate communion with God. He may take us to a place that we weren't expecting. He does it because he loves us and he wants us to know the truth and he wants us to know the purposes for our lives that he has for us if we are willing to listen. But we need to know he is approachable. He does listen. And he does respond. I want to kind of wrap this up with a, an excerpt from C.S. Lewis's The Silver Chair. In this particular excerpt, Jill has just been taken into the land of Narnia. And she lands in the forest and she walks a long distance and boom, she comes out of the trees and there's a giant lion lying next to this stream. And here's how it goes. And she's thirsty. If I run away, it will be after me in a moment, she thought. And if I go on, I shall run straight into its mouth. Anyway, she couldn't move as she had tried, and she couldn't take her eyes off it. How long this lasted, she could not be sure. It seemed like hours. And the thirst became so bad that she almost felt she would not mind being eaten by the lion if only she could be sure of getting a mouthful of water first. Are you not thirsty, said the lion. I'm dying of thirst, said Jill. Then drink, said the lion. May I, uh, could I, uh, would you mind going away while I do, said Jill. The lion answered this only by a look and a very low growl. And as Jill gazed at his motionless bulk, she realized that she might as well have asked the whole mountain to move aside for her convenience. The delicious rippling noise of the stream was driving her nearly frantic. Will you promise not to do anything to me if I do come, said Jim? I make no promise, said the lion. 
Jill was so thirsty now, without noticing it, she had taken a step nearer. Do you eat girls? She said. I have swallowed up girls and boys, women and men, kings and emperors, cities and realms, said the lion. It didn't say this as if it were boasting, nor as if it were sorry, nor as if it were angry. It just said it. I daren't come and drink, said Jill. Then you will die of thirst, said the lion. Oh dear, said Jill, taking another step closer. I suppose I must go and look for another stream then. There is no other stream, said the lion. It never occurred to Jill to disbelieve the lion, and no one who had seen his stern face could do that. Her mind suddenly made itself up. It was the worst thing she ever had to do, but she went straight to the stream, knelt down, and began scooping up water in her hand. It was the coldest, most refreshing water she had ever tasted. You didn't need to drink much of it, for it quenched your thirst at once. Before she tasted it, she had been intending to make a dash away from the line the moment she had finished. Now she realized that this would be, on the whole, the most dangerous thing of all. And as we approach Jesus, he gives us living water to us. Let us pray. Almighty God, Sometimes it's difficult to come and kneel in your presence, to spend time with you. And so we ask that you send your Holy Spirit to help us, to lead us and guide us in this way, that our fears would be put aside, and that you would help us to be in your presence. Christ our Lord. Amen. Our offertory sentence today comes from 1 John chapter 3. Whosoever hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his compassion from him, how dwelleth 